Hey folks, I am, uh, they've changed the interface again since I did this last time. Oh, here is everybody. Um, hey Nancy, how are you? And I assume that Danny's up there. Let's check. There you are, Danny. A cuss. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Uganda's laws, of uh, gay laws are horrific. And there's a long American history behind that as well. Memphis. Oh, heavens, we were just there. We loved, well, I loved Memphis. Buddy's got a sweet spot in his heart for Cleveland, but I love Memphis. Uh, Baton Rouge. Hey, Nancy, how are you? Uh, another Nancy. My other Nancy is from Michigan. All right, so I'm going to jump into this uh, right away. First of all, in answer to your question about the ellipse, eclipse i'm sorry the ellipse is in my head because of january 6th no i didn't see it i didn't see it because of a really stupid reason i did get to see it filtered through leaves but the truth was that i had to be somewhere by four o'clock yesterday to, to an event and um, i was very worried about getting there on time and where i live it's hard to get um uh cars to come and um so and there there I, I didn't know i just didn't dare to leave it to the normal time thinking, oh, they're going to take 40 minutes to get here. So I, I better go ahead and call uh, a, a, a lift. And, um, uh, and they literally the driver came in a minute. I, I wasn't dressed. I, my hair was wet, the whole thing. And so I just ran out the door, but I ran out the door without anything to, to see the, 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 the eclipse with. And of course you weren't going to find that in Bo downtown Boston yesterday. So I watched it through the leaves and I uh, am enjoying everybody's pictures. And it was actually kind of cool to be walking down Commonwealth Avenue um, with the, the, the darkness coming behind me. So that was kind of cool. All right. So that was that question. You have a lot of questions today and I'm going to try and put them into some kind of order. Um, in part because, I don't know if you feel this way, I certainly feel like there is so much news that it's, and it's not, it's very, very important news, but it's like incremental little things. So it's really hard, like you'll read everything about, you know, a case that's happening in, um, you know, with the Commerce Department and a major corporation, and then you're like, but wait a minute, that has nothing to do with what's in the news right now over here about Trump and about Biden and about Gaza and about, you know, and so I've been actually spending a lot of time sort of stepping back and saying, what's the big picture here? And I feel maybe like everybody could use a what's the big picture here in this moment, because otherwise it just gets exhausting. Um, and, and, and you sort of, I don't know, I sort of feel like I do a deep dive on something and then I come out and I think, well, I just learned everything there was to know about X and it doesn't seem to have a part of the bigger picture. So I'm going to do some big picture stuff today that I hope ties in a lot of your questions. So first of all, I want to emphasize when we are talking about what is happening in the United States in this moment, there are two separate things going on. They're related, but they are separate things. So on the one hand, we have former President Donald Trump and everything that he and his movement represent and running parallel or, or maybe not parallel in connection with that, but really on a separate track is that since 1981, the Republican Party has operated under an ideology that says the way to make the country better for everybody to increase the the uh, prosperity of the country and to make sure that all boats rise together and i'm i'm actually taking their ideology from their perspective right now in order to do that what you need to do is you need to concentrate wealth at the top of the economy and what will happen if you do that is that a very few really smart business people, businessmen for the most part, will invest their money really wisely and they will most efficiently grow the economy that will produce more jobs. That's why you hear sometimes about makers and takers is they're thought of as being the job makers, the job creators that will create more jobs. They will be better paid and everybody will do better. Um, there, those two things are coming both to, uh, to, the 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 final outcome of their um of their trajectories at the same time and so we often conflate the two because trump of course is now the leader of the republican party but he's actually kind of quite separate from from the larger 40-year republican history there and american history there he rose to power on that but 
he's actually doing something very different right now. So let me start with Trump. And remember that I'm going to divide these two things out because I think part of the issue is we tangle them together and then it's hard for people to be like, you know, what's going on here? Why, you know, Trump is the Republican Party, but why then is the Republican Party doing this and, and all that sort of stuff? So let me start with what Trump represents in this moment. And that is Trump is very clearly running to become an authoritarian, running to become a dictator. And, you know, it's funny because one of the things that people in the United States spend a lot of time talking about is whether or not he's a fascist. To me, this is not a terribly interesting question, and I'll explain why. Because fascism is a product of the 1920s. Uh, Benito Mussolini is thought of as being the person who really articulates a vision of a society in which big business works together with the government to create a very strong sense of nationalism and a, and a military complex that can then assert its will both internally and externally. And there's a lot more to it. But the reason that I say it's not a terribly interesting question to me is because when you think about the fascists, not necessarily so much Mussolini, but certainly Adolf Hitler, who followed Mussolini's pattern in Germany in, um, in, in the lead up to the uh, World War II, um, they, uh, Hitler literally, when his people were writing the legal codes that would discriminate against certain people in Germany, they looked to the United States. They looked to the Jim Crow laws and the Juan Crow laws and the, the systems in the United States that corralled indigenous Americans into reservations in order to write those laws for, um, for the, the 20th century in their countries. So, so to me, to talk about fascism, I think what people are doing is they're saying, hey, wait a minute, this is really bad stuff and it led us to World War II. To my mind, the bigger issue is not simply the flavor of authoritarianism that we have in this moment, but rather its application in the United States. And what I mean by that is that I think it really helps to think about the origins of the United States in the, the Declaration of Independence and that extraordinarily radical document that says that all men are created equal. Now, we know, and I've talked about this, I've done videos about this, and there's all kinds of caveats around that, that is warnings around that, that when, when the founders said all men are created equal, they meant all men like us. They meant, they meant white men, white men of property, and there are various reasons that that enabled them to have this vision of equality. But the, the point remains that suggesting that a nation can be formed on the idea of equality rather than the idea that some people are better than others, is deeply radical. It was deeply radical in 1776. It is deeply radical today across the world, but, in, but also in the United States of America. So contrary to that, a different way to organize society is the much more traditional idea that some people are better than others. And those some people might be better than others because of wealth or because of family or because of religion or because of education or because of nationality. I mean, you can draw your own, uh, your own, uh, did I say race? Obviously race, obviously gender. Um, you, you can draw whichever elements in that you think that hierarchy should be made up of. But that idea that some people are better than others is as deeply rooted in the United States as it is rooted in, in Europe, for example. And the, the, the reason that I'm, I'm focusing on that is because when we focus on whether or not Trump is a fascist, there's many pieces of fascism that the United States may or may not fit into. But we can absolutely say, without any doubt, that he and his supporters believe that some people are better than others and that those people have the right to rule. And they think so for different reasons. For some of his supporters, they think that their religion makes them better than other people. For some of his supporters, they think their money makes them better than other people. For some people, they think simply believing in Trump makes them better people. But they do not believe in, Amer in, in human equality. They don't believe in the principles of the United States of America. So how do we know that? So the thing that, that a lot of people keep asking about, and it exists, you're, you are able to look it up yourself, but it's really badly written and it's almost a thousand pages, so you may not want to do that, 
and that is Project 2025. So Project 2025 is a project, uh, like I say, about a thousand pages. It's a blueprint for a second Trump administration or an administration of someone like Trump. And it calls for the, it's a blueprint. So it calls for the installation of a president who cannot be checked either by the courts or by Congress. There's a long history of an argument, a right-wing argument for that in the United States. It's complete BS, but there is an argument for it. Um, so they want basically a dictator. They want to get rid of the nonpartisan civil service that we have had since 1883 and replace those experts with loyalists. So long as they are loyal and they will carry out the wishes of that dictator, they will be the ones who get into office. They want to impose on the United States religious values, that is their religious values, and that includes, of course, getting rid of abortion. Many many of the people involved in these projects want to get rid of no-fault divorce. Um, certainly LGBTQ plus people are going to be um, at best written off the map. They are also concerned about immigration, the idea that they want to get rid of immigrants to the United States. And in Trump's case, his people have said that they are going to round up and deport 10 million people now living in the United States, and that includes not only undocumented immigrants and people who've applied for asylum, it also means that they are going to attack birthright citizenship, which has been established since 1898 and was written into the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And, um, and the idea is to create a society that imposes on the majority, the rest of us who don't want this, a vision of a hierarchical society that, or a higher, hierarchical society in which our voices don't matter. And that's what Project 2025 is. There is also an accompanying that, um, uh, the 14, 47 Project, which is much more specifically aimed just at a Trump second, a second term. And um, the, the idea behind that, as I say, is to get rid of the idea that, that I have a say or that most of you have a say or that, that, that laws should treat everybody equally. And you can look at what that looks like, first of all, by, by turning your glance to Hungary, where um, the, the people who wrote the Project 2025's the Heritage um, Foundation and their, they had 29 other organizations that were working with them in the production of this document, but they are working closely with the Danube Institute in Budapest, which is the right-hand think tank, if you will, to Viktor Orban. And Viktor Orban has gotten rid of democracy in Hungary by taking control of the media, by outlawing opposition parties and silencing them on the media. He has instituted uh, discriminatory laws against LGBTQ plus people. He has um, instituted laws against um, women's rights and so on. And they are working very closely, of course, with the radical right in America. So we have the CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, which um, has has had meetings in Hungary and it has had Orban come speak. And, you know, you see the, the movement back and forth of former Fox News, um, Fox News Channel uh, host uh, Tucker Carlson moving back and forth between Hungary and the United States with the idea that they literally believe that the idea of treating everybody equally means things like women working outside the home and it means abortion rights and it means LGBTQ plus rights and it means minority rights and it means the idea that everybody should be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in their government and they do not believe in that they believe that that is destroying society so they're actively working against that so that's what the Trump movement is about. But what's happening now with Trump himself, which is another question that you have asked about, and that is, as I look at Trump, not being a medical doctor, I am extraordinarily aware of his inability right now to read an audience, which was always his strength, but also to make it, to, to finish a sentence, really, and also um, his inability often to speak. And that suggests to me that he is no longer as able to play an audience as he was even in 2016. Now, if you remember, we really didn't see a lot of him once he, we saw a lot of him in 2016, but once he was in office, we didn't see a lot of him. He was fairly carefully handled. And then of course we had the coronavirus um, 
pandemic in which we did see him in front of the cameras briefly and he said such off the wall stuff he stopped doing those those presentations and now we are seeing him in very very carefully packaged ways which suggests to me so if you watch that video yesterday in which he suggested his opinions about abortion suggested them only by the way um uh, it was very heavily edited, and it that says to me that they don't trust him to to speak in front of a group of people. So, um, for example, right now, I am I will almost certainly, as I always do, misspeak during this at some point, but I don't have any notes. I mean, I've got an outline. I am able to carry on a conversation, and it may not be perfect, but it is something that that you're seeing without a filter. We have not seen Trump without a filter now for a very long time. So why did I mention all that? It's going to make it very hard for him to campaign for one thing. I don't know if you're paying attention and you may not be because it's been a little hard with everything else going on, but Biden's out there every day. He's all over the country. He's going to swing states. He's doing, he's doing, um, um, interestingly enough, they keep saying he's not doing press conferences, but in fact, he speaks to the press almost every day. Um, he is meeting with, with heads of state. He's out there all the time. And if there were something really off about Biden, we would have heard it because he's out there all the time. Trump is not out there all the time. They're, they're really keeping him under wraps. And I think that's going to be really difficult for him, not only in this campaign, but also because his trial, his criminal trial for, um, inter for uh, election interference in 2016 is beginning in a week, less than a week. It's beginning on, they're starting to choose a jury on April 15th. And he's going to be at the trial and he's going to be supposed to be keeping his mouth shut. And so far he has not been able to do that in a legal setting like that. He certainly was not able to in the fraud case in which he kept mumbling, kept saying all sorts of things. I think it's going to be difficult for him to do that, and that's going to hurt him both in that case, but also in the news as people watch him unable to control himself and recognize that whoever becomes president has the nuclear codes, among other things. So I think that's an issue for him. I think there is also the very real issue going into this election in this particular moment. I'm not doing the whole election thing, but I'm trying to describe where we are right now in this moment. Um, this bond is a problem. This bond that he had to put up to stop New York Attorney General Letitia James from going after his property, making good the amount he owes, um, it's called an appeals bond. So what that means is that he has to put up for the state of New York, the judge, um, Judge Arthur Engeron, has uh, judged that he owes the people of the state of New York $454 million plus interest, and that interest is accruing very, very rapidly. In order, and that judgment it needs to be paid, but he wants to appeal that judgment, which is his right to do that, but in order for him to appeal it, he has to put up for the state a bond or, or, a, or cash for the amount plus a, plus some more than that, I don't remember what percent it is more than that, that says that if in fact he loses the appeal, that the 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 the, the, the people of the state of New York are going to are going to get their money, and that's um, he had to do the same thing for the second case of um, E. Jean Carroll, that was uh, about a month before, and that he did put up a legitimate bond for. But based largely on his cash, and that seems to have wiped him out. And now remember, you can't you can't take anything that Donald Trump says at face value. Absolutely nothing. I do not know why the media still does it. When you're faced with a chronic liar, you you have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. So I think as I wrote recently, he said he got six hundred sixty million dollars at night in a, in a, one night. I, let, let's let's see the papers. Let's see the receipts. Anyway. Um, he continues to claim that he has enough money to cover the, um, the, the, the bond that he has paid, which is significantly less than it was originally supposed to be. It's, four, it's a $454 million 
judgment plus interest. But he and his lawyers went to the court and said, this is ridiculous. This is impossible to get for all these different reasons. Can you reduce it? An appeals court reduced it to $175 million, which is still a lot of money, especially when you've already put up close to 100 for something else. But he produced this bond or his lawyers produced this bond and the more we learn about this bond, the more it looks like it's not a real bond at all. Um, there were a number of stories about it yesterday, including a, a, a leading story from the Daily Beast that said, you know, according to the terms of this bond, all the bond says is that if the judgment goes against Trump, he'll pay the, the amount. That's not worth the paper it's written on. So the reason that I think that is an issue, first of all, is because if he cannot produce a bond, so uh, Letitia James, the Attorney General of New York, went to the court and said, hey, he needs to, to make sure this is real. You know, this is, you gotta true this baby. And he's got until, he had, she, gave him, she asked for 10 days, the court gave him 10 days, and I do not remember when that started. It's sometime this week that he's gotta true that, and there's a hearing on it on April 22nd. If he can't do that, if he cannot come up with a real bond, or if they can't fix that bond so it becomes real, a lot of the paperwork wasn't filed correctly either, then she's going to start seizing his property. And again, I look at everything politically, not everything, but I mean, my political hat is on now. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, what does that look like for somebody who has made his career based on the idea that he's a multi-billionaire? to not be able to come up with $175,000. I mean, $175 million. Um, that, and remember, that's a huge sum to you and me, but the judgment was about 20% of his net worth. So think about it. If you, heaven forbid, or I, even, even more heaven forbid, were suddenly asked to come up with 20% of our net worth. So we have 30 days to come up with 20% of our net worth we could probably do it. I mean, we'd have to sell stuff. We'd probably have to borrow. We, you know, we, you know, might have to take out a mortgage on our house. There's, there, 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 there are ways that we would, you know, it would not be easy. It would not be painless, but we could do it. The judgment against Trump is about 20% of what he claims to be worth and he can't do it, which suggests that in fact, he's not worth that much money to me anyway, and that's not gonna play well to all the people who think he's this great businessman. It also means that he's gonna be in hock to people who are, he's then gonna to have to do what they want. That's not a good thing going into this election. And then also, um, the, the, the vision that he is, is not able to pay that money is, I, I think, really a profound attack on what he claims to be and also who he sees himself as. You know, I've always suspected that he was completely leveraged and there wasn't a lot of money there um, because he put, would put his name on stuff and then he would mortgage everything to the hilt. So I think we're, we're looking at what might be a very difficult rest of the month for Trump. So what Trump is trying to do is obviously to stay out of prison on the one hand, he's, he's putting off all these, these um, these cases until after the election with the hope that he can get rid of them. But he's trying to get rid of American democracy. And the people who support him are trying to get rid of American democracy because they see him as a vehicle by which they can impose Christian nationalism on the rest of the country. And that's that's what he's been up to. All right, I hope you're with me on that. Um, because I want to move now to the Republican Party, because they they are now the same. He has taken over the Republican Party and made it the Trump Party. But what's happening in the country right now also has to do with the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party worked so hard since 1981 to create a, an economic and a political system that in fact did stratify our society and did in fact put a very few people in charge of our country. Um, with, you know, what they were really interested in was the concentration of wealth. So we got significant deregulation of business, that is, they can do whatever they want, and we got uh, very, very low taxes for the very wealthiest people. So we hear a lot now, for example, about how the, the deficit is so bad. You know, move your, your head back to the Clinton administration, they were operating in the black. 
the 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 Clinton administration balanced the budget. They were operating in the black. Um, but what's the first thing that happened when George W. Bush got into office is he slashed taxes yet again. So if you look at just the George W. Bush taxes and the Trump taxes of 2017, if you got rid of just those two things, not the Reagan taxes, although people like me think the Reagan taxes uh, tax cuts were also a mistake, but if you got rid of just those two, the budget would be fine and we would not have to worry about Social Security and Medicare. And the, the larger picture of what you're seeing in the country right now is the recognition among a lot of people who were not previously paying attention that the very wealthy have gamed the system through the Republican Party. So, um, so how have they done that? I was, I was going to do this later, but I will, I will do this. How have they done that? They have done so by suppressing the vote, which began in the, the 1980s, 1986 is when the Republicans start talking about what they call ballot integrity, and they say that they expect to float, throw black people off the rolls. They have done, and that's continued since then, they have done it through extraordinary gerrymandering after the 2010 election. And you'll remember that the 2010 election is the first one that happens um, after Citizens United, which enables governments to, I'm sorry, uh, businesses to pour money into races. And what they did is they took over state houses so they could take states like North Carolina, which is, which is a purple state. It's about, a, 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 you know, everyone hovers right there around 50. But they gave, they carved up the state in such a way that the Republicans have a super majority. The same thing in Tennessee, the same thing in Ohio. They, they managed to, uh, to really amplify, and Michigan is another one, really amplify the votes of Republicans so that they could run both state governments and then also the congressional delegations. So they really managed to stack the House of Representatives as well. So they've done it through that, but they've done something else that I have just tumbled onto thanks to an article by, well, it's not by him, he was interviewed, a legal analyst named Mark Stern. And he pointed out that when he took off, and I'm, I'm this, isn't, this is not entire, the smart piece of this is him. I'm filling in some of the political backstory that he did not put in that. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm not sounding like I'm taking his idea here because I think he's dead right. And that is, and he should get credit for it, and that is uh, Mitch McConnell becomes Senate Majority Leader in 2007. That's the year before uh, Barack Obama is elected president. And he recognizes by then that the Republicans do not can, they do not command a majority of voters, even with the voter suppression, and we don't have the, the extreme gerrymandering yet, but even with voter suppression, he recognizes that the vast majority of Americans like Social Security, they like Medicare, they like a clean water and clean air, they like business regulations, and Mitch McConnell's really a business guy, um, you know, really working for businesses. And so he recognizes that if he can stop Congress from passing any laws, that what they can do is they can pack the courts, which they had been doing, Republicans had been doing since Reagan. They can pack the courts with people who think like they do and extremists who think even more extreme things than they do. And rather than having to write laws that pass their point of view, which they can't get through because Americans don't like them, they can simply throw things into the courts that are packed with their extremists. And from there, they will be able simply to hand down law. And that, once I recognized that in this article, as I say, it came out about a month ago, I wrote about it, I linked to it. I realized that's exactly what we're seeing. So when we see, for example, the case of Matthew Kaczmarek, the anti-abortion doctor, the extremist anti-abortion uh, judge, not doctor in, there you go, there's my, I told you I'd misspeak at least once, in, um, in Texas, who was appointed by Donald Trump. He has worked very hard to get rid of abortion nationwide by getting rid of the Federal Food and Drug Administration's approval of the drug Mifepristone, which is the most commonly used, or one of the most commonly used drugs in abortions. Now, that will not pass. You know that Americans overwhelmingly liked Roe versus Wade. As many as 81% of them recently said they want that codified into law. But all you need is that one judge in Texas and a case to go to that one judge in Texas, and it was a made up case, it was an artificial case, which judges are not supposed to take, 
to change the entire laws across the country. So they have managed to, to turn a minority that will uh, cut taxes, cut regulations for business, and impose Christian nationalism on the rest of us um, by manipulating the system. And that is how they have managed to get this kind of power. Now, why is that an issue right now? It's an issue right now because people have woken up and they're seeing what has happened. So why am I putting it that way? I'm putting that way because one of the things you're seeing in the polls is people saying, well, what has Biden done? You know, look at look at this. I just realized that, you know, I'm getting screwed over here. I'm getting screwed over here. I'm getting screwed. They weren't paying attention before and they weren't getting oxygen before because the media was not covering those sorts of stories. They weren't covering the fact, for example, that, you know, how the the, the Trump tax cuts came out. You know, there's plenty of information about that, but there was there were no headlines. To, I shouldn't say no. There were few headline stories saying these tax cuts are going to screw over everybody who isn't one of the very wealthy people. So what, what has Biden done about all this stuff? First of all, he has turned Trump over to the Department of Justice. He has washed his hands. He has said, this is not my business. That's the point of a Department of Justice. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. And that has meant that it's been in the hands of Merrick Garland, who is the Attorney General, and who seems to have been trying very, very hard to make sure that he could never be accused of political bias. And that is, and I'm going to be a Libra here on you, I'm an agnostic about that. We know that preserving democracy demands that you cross all your T's and dot all your I's about the law, but there is certainly suggestions that Merrick Garland has worried about it a bit too much, as in the appointment of a Trump Republican to look into Biden's um, the, the, the classified documents that Biden had in his possession from his time as a vice president. Um, you know, if the guy had been operating honestly, he would have done the same thing they did with Pence, which is to give him a one page document that says you're in the clear it was an error. Don't do it again. Same thing they did to Pence. Instead, as you know, um, her said that said that in the first page and then went on for more than 300 pages basically slurring Biden or trying to slur Biden. It was actually a really interesting document in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, as people have pointed out that in the six special count, special counsels who have been appointed since Clinton, um, whether or not they were interviewed, they were um, um, looking, investigating uh, Republicans or Democrats, they have all been Republicans. So Republicans investigate Republicans and Dem and Republicans investigate Democrats. And that's, uh, you know, I don't think that's right, personally. Uh, I think they we should have instituted that it's somebody by the opposite party or somebody from the same party. I, I, I think opposite is better personally, but the point is it's not fair when the Republicans get to investigate everybody and the Democrats just sit there and say, okay, we're playing by the rules. So Biden has turned everything over to Garland and the what that has meant is really interesting. The good piece of that, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use judgments like that. The, 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 one of the things that has come from that is that there have been more than a thousand people who participated in the events of January 6th who have been, uh, have, have gone to trial, many of whom have either pleaded guilty or been found guilty and gone to jail. And what that has done is, you know, Trump and people like Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene are trying to say that they're victims, that they're, um, they're hostages. In fact, they have had the benefit of the legal system, lawyers, et cetera. And um, what that has, has so it's given the, the Trump people that argument, but at the same time, it has meant that you're not seeing mass movements running to Trump's support. And that's really important because he has tried to get people to rally around him. He, you know, he kept saying, if they indict me, come down to Mar-a-Lago. Or um, there was a big move to get people to go to the border of Texas uh, to protest um, immigration across that border. Uh, I guess it was last month, maybe it was two months ago, and 19 trucks showed up. 19 trucks is, you know, not even the parking lot of your supermarket. So that idea that you could get arrested and end up in prison for doing the things that Trump is asking you to do has actually acted as a real damper on uh, on movements, on movements behind on on popular movements behind Trump. So he has done that. 
What we do have, though, is that uh, Trump has largely skated from um, from the cases that that are associated with his behavior in the 2020 election. And that is not necessarily attributable to Garland, but what it means is that the American people are not going to get to hear some of the cases that we should hear before we go vote. Now we will, starting next week, start to hear the criminal case of his inter election interference in 2016. And it is my observation that he is n very, very concerned about the testimony that the American public is going to hear in that case, because we're going to have Michael Cohen, his former fixer, fixer testify. We're going to have um, uh, Stormy Daniels, the adult film actress, testify. We're going to have uh, Karen McDougal, who was uh, allegedly had an affair with him for seven or eight months testify and we now know that Hope Hicks is going to testify as well. So he's clearly concerned about something that somebody might say. And remember, they're not going to be able to talk about anything they want. They have to keep it to this particular case. And with the the case, if I hear one more person call it the hush money case, that's not what it's about. The case is, um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, I guess maybe they think it sounds like a movie. The, the, the issue is that it was clear before the election that there were people who had very damaging and true information about Trump. And he worked together with other people to buy their stories and um, and make sure that they didn't leak out to the American people. And the uh, the the case that started all this was his payment of uh, I think it was $130,000 to Stormy Daniels and the subsequent cooking of his financial books so that that would not show. And that's a violation of election laws. And that's what's going on here. It's not that he had an affair on his wife. It's not that he is, you know, per, behaves badly at times. It's that the American people had a right to know the real stories about him. And he illegally, allegedly um, hid those stories so that we didn't know that. Because you know perfectly well, after that Access Hollywood tape, if we had known about Stormy Daniels, if we'd known about Karen McDougal, if we'd known some of these other stories, we would have, uh, it would have changed the way at that point that a number of evangelicals had voted. They're wedded to him now, but they weren't then, and other people as well. All right, so that's what is going on with that. So if that's what Biden has done about Trump, here's the thing that bothers me, and that's that I was reading just this morning, I think it was, a progressive person saying, you know, I don't care. There's no difference between Biden and Trump. What has Biden done? And and my jaw kind of hit the floor because Biden has rejected that vision of society that the Republicans began to embrace in 1981. He has said, no, we are not going to build the economy by making sure that people at the top have all the money. We are going to do what the United States did between 1933 and 1981, and that is that we're going to use the government and laws to make sure that the rich people don't get everything. And it's worth pointing out that in the period between 1981 and 2021, when Biden took office, um, the, the, the Republicans often talked about socialism and they didn't want to redistribute wealth and all that sort of thing, but in fact, the economists estimate that $53 trillion moved from the bottom 90% to the top 10%, and mostly to the top 1%. 53 trillion trillion dollars. So Biden has said, no, that system doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. What you did is you hollowed out the middle class by taking all that money away from them. You made everybody's lives far more difficult. You didn't ever actually lower taxes. What changed was not the taxes. What changed was who paid them. So rather than having corporations and the very wealthy pay taxes, all those tax cuts went to them and people, you know, ordinary people ended up paying those taxes. And Biden said, no, we're not going to operate this way anymore. So what has he done? First of all, the policies that he's put in place did something really dramatic. So remember, coming out of the pandemic, that's not to say the disease is not still with us, but I'm talking about the lockdown period that crashed the economy. Coming out of that, 
the you know, the Democrats at first the the Republicans during Trump actually put together at least one coronavirus package. But coming out of that, as soon as Biden took office, and remember he had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, thanks to John Ossoff and Gabriel uh, and um, Raphael Warnock in in Georgia. Thank you very much, Stacey Abrams. What they managed to do was they managed to to actually undermine what Mitch McConnell had tried to do by stopping Congress from act acting. They had managed to um, put in place the American Rescue Plan. And what the American Rescue Plan did is it focused on rebuilding the economy. That was the, the heartbeat of it. It was not just about aid as the earlier coronavirus packages had been about. It was about investing in the economy so that the United States could get up and running fast. And it worked. It worked extraordinarily well. The United States recovered from the pandemic faster than any other developed country in the world. You look at 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 any um, at any uh, statistics, the United States just looks great on that front. Now, at the same time, we had uh, inflation, and we had inflation not only because of supply chain issues, which, by the way, started during the Trump administration, but we but also because what happened is that uh, corporations took advantage of shortages to raise their prices significantly, and they didn't bring them down. Because what happened is with the American Rescue Plan, people had money again and they could afford those higher prices. And so if you look at major corporations in the United States, what they did is they either bought back stock or they gave out extraordinary dividends. They made they made record profits for the first couple of years after the pandemic. So what's happened then is that Biden is really focused on rebuilding the American economy and at the same time getting rid of things like do not compete clauses, which the the, you know, you can imagine if you are, you know, an animator who's got some specific thing you do, you can't take what you do from company A to company B. But the non-compete clauses had been proliferating to the point that in some places, even fast food things said you couldn't compete, you couldn't leave one fast food joint and go to another. They've cracked down on those. They've also really made an effort to increase wages at the bottom of the scale. And what that has meant, and this is actually really important, what that has meant is that if, if you divide the American demographic into 20% increments, since Biden took office, the lower 80%, the bottom four of those increments, have seen wage increases faster than inflation. So if you're one of the lower 40, lower 80 contingents there, you're 80, the 80% 80 of the American people, your wages have grown faster than, um, than uh, inflation. And that is because of the full employment that we've had, which is extraordinary. We've had 26 months of employment under four, unemployment under 4%, which means that, that if you're if you are looking for jobs, especially at the bottom of the of the, the job ladder, you can move more easily. You can hold out for better wages. You can demand better wages. And what that has meant, as I say, is that we've got these eighty percent who's who are making more money than they did before. The top twenty percent is not. That top twenty percent, their wage increases have not outpaced inflation. What does that mean? It means that we are starting to compress a little bit the difference between those at the very top and the rest of us, those people at the bottom. Now, in, in the, when that happened between 1933, when FDR was elected, went into office, he's elected in 32, he takes office in March, still in that period of 1933. Between 1933 and 1981, we had what economists call the Great Compression. And that was when the wealth and income between the very wealthy and the very bottom began to squish together. So, for example, the, the president of Ford Motor Company in, in that era made maybe, maybe and I don't have the numbers in front of me, 12 times what a worker did by the, by 19, I'm sorry, by 2020, that person made, you know, 435 times. I mean, we've had since 1981 what economists call the great um, divergence in which we've got this extraordinary spread again. So Biden's working on bringing that down. 
he's only starting and he's only starting for this major reason that is that he has managed to put in place a lot of the legislation and not just him by the way nancy pelosi got this stuff through the house of representatives masterfully and of course the senate was in democratic hands as well even though kirsten kirsten cinema left the democrats and became an independent and joe manchin um, was rarely on board with some of them the some of this stuff because he's from uh, a, a, a Republican state of West Virginia, both of whom are leaving the Senate by the way in um, in this election, I think. Yes. Um, so uh, so they've managed to get through not only the American Rescue Plan but also, for example, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. They got a lot of uh, not a lot. They got some Republican votes on that, and that was to do things like rebuild bridges and rebuild the roads that had never really gotten fixed in that period from 1981 to 2021. Because again, the idea was that the very wealthy would manage this really well, and they would invest in things that made money. Well, if their if infrastructure projects didn't look to them like they would make money they didn't get done so we have this enormous backlog of things that have to be fixed including for example not not i shouldn't said including we also have the issue that in that same period technologies have changed and there has been a real push among the the corporations to make a lot more money so for example the bridge the the, the container ship that hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore was significantly bigger than that bridge was meant to accommodate in terms of being hit. It has been hit in the past, but when it was hit in the past, it was hit by much smaller uh, container ships that did not pack the kind of wallop that the one that hit it um, a few weeks ago did. So we've got a lot of that, a lot of that stuff is a huge backlog and they're starting to do that with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, but you can't turn around 40 years of neglect in what now is three years. So we've got that. He's also done, they've also done the Chips and Science Act, which is an enormous um, investment in returning silicon sh chip manufacturing to the United States and it was done in such a way that it was designed to bring in private investment as well and it has brought in billions and billions of private investment there was a big announcement just last week I haven't written about yet but that's coming as well with the idea that he wants to turn the United States back into a manufacturing hub but not the kind of manufacturers we don't use anymore instead things like chips so there's that there is also the inflation reduction act another trillion dollar um, investment although that one's a little bit harder to figure out because a lot of money got moved around for that one i always hate writing about it because it's not all new investment some of it got pulled in from elsewhere but that not only um uh that invests in a number of things, but it also invests in climate change. Now, the Republicans are trying to get rid of all that. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it invests in climate change, but it also invests in, it gives the power of the federal government to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies to provide, um, so that they, they actually cannot charge consumers whatever they want, which is something that had happened under George W. Bush. And so, um, so that's why we have now the, um, among other things, um, the, um, the, the caps on insulin, the cost of insulin at $35, as you know, people were having to ration their insulin. So they brought down that and they're now negotiating over 10 other drugs, which by the way, all the pharmaceutical companies are fighting, saying that this is an infringement of their ability to do business, even though every other country in the world either has a price cap or negotiates with pharmaceutical companies so that they, they are, their costs have to be, um, uh, you know, approximately what they are, uh, you know, what, what it costs to manufacture them plus a reasonable profit. We also have not just that happening, though. We have um, the Commerce Department under Lena Khan is working very hard to, uh, to stop the monopolies who are able, who have been able to run the country in such a way that they can do whatever they want. And my leap to Lena Khan comes from the fact that if you use an inhaler, you will know that they have suddenly come dramatically down in price and they have done so because she said to the people who manufacture inhalers, you're pretending these are new patents and they are not. You're listing them as new patents. They should be in the public domain now. And she won. And that's why um, recently, uh, within the last few weeks, the cost of inhalers has come down dramatically. So they have been trying to use the apparatus of the federal government to, to create fairness again, to, instead of saying, as we did under um, 
uh, under Ronald Reagan and then under a new version of looking at antitrust law that was put together by Robert Bork, that Robert Bork, yes, that so long, you know, big corporations are fine so long as they lower prices, but then once they have merged, they can do whatever they want. Um, instead of that, they're actually saying, no, we're not going to have corporations that, 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 that price gouge, that, um, that, drive down wages, that drive down um, the conditions of life for people, that make it impossible for entrepreneurs to get into the market. They're really working on doing that. However, a crucial piece of this, and this is me talking, not them, by the way, although Biden certainly talks about this, but my big thing is taxes. You know I love taxes, and I love the study of taxes. I don't like to pay my taxes more than anybody else does, but what we have done by slashing taxes so dramatically since 1981, because you've got the two Reagan tax cuts in there as well, is we have basically said we are willing to create a system in which if you are able to amass wealth in whatever way it takes, that's good, you're good to go and you don't have to contribute back to society and in, in the proportion to which you have been benefited by society. And it was actually the Republican Party, I'm a scholar of the Republican Party, who way back in the 1860s said, no, 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 that's not the way society should work. If you've made a lot of money, you should contribute to society um, according to your wealth, not according to, to you know, some flat fee that everybody pays. And at one point, a Republican actually says that, that a wealthy man should pay up to 99% of a Republican, 99% of his wealth to the public good. And this is in the 1860s. And of course, under Eisenhower, you had, who's a Republican president, you had tax rates of 91% on the upper tax bracket. Now, in reality, they paid slightly less than that because there were loopholes and things. But the idea that we are arguing now about the fact that Trump wants to cut taxes yet again to put them down even lower than they already are, it seems to me is a real problem. And one of the things that I think you're looking at in a Biden's second term is a real push for higher taxes on the very wealthy, which, by the way, is extraordinarily popular. And by the very wealthy, what I mean is corporations, and there's a longer story behind that, and um, nobody under who makes under $400,000 would pay any more. So it's people whose annual income is above $400,000, which is not a lot of people. So, um, so that's the other piece of that. So what has he done? That is what he has done. He is also trying to do something that is to rebuild the country around a different kind of an economy. And this is something that he tried really hard to do in his first term with what was the Build Back Better plan. Out of that, he got the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is... Um, uh, the one that's rebuilding all what I would call the hard infrastructure of the country. But the other half of that was what I would call the soft infrastructure. And it's based around the idea of caregiving. So if you think about the United States in the 21st century, our child care and our elder care is appalling compared to any other nation in the world. And our education ain't so great either. That is the cost of education, especially higher education, is really prohibitive for a lot of people, but certainly child care is and elder care is. And he has worked um, really hard to, and is working really hard to create a, a better system in which we have affordable child care. So, you know, I don't know how many of you are dealing with child care issues, but, um, um, when I when my kids were little, my entire salary went to childcare, and which was doable because I was married and we we had a we were a dual income family. But it's really not sustainable for for most people. And I have uh, family members who live in in Europe, and their cost their cost for their children each child so you have to pay for both of them for every day in U.S. dollars is $17 a day. It, it, it's just mind boggling to me. And you think of all the societal good that comes from that, you know, the, the I, I just, I just, I just can't even start. But um, anyway, so he's focusing on that and also on elder care, because we have a real issue with elder care in this country as well, and all sorts of caregiving. But if you think about the way the economy works, and you think about the, the, um, uh, the, the fact that we have places that are in desperate need 
of income in this country. One of the things that always jumps out to me is that when you talk about bringing a, a silicon plant, for example, to somewhere, that's great, but you got to build something you need in kinds of all kinds of hard infrastructure. If you're talking about elder care, we already have a lot of that infrastructure in place. That is what we really need to do is to invest in the people, not in the infrastructure. And that's something that would in fact bring a lot of money to my small town in Maine because we got a lot of elderly people. We have, you know, if you were actually paying elder care workers to the degree that they deserve, you'd bring a lot more money into the economy. So that's one of the things, he doesn't talk about that at all, that was again me. So that's one of the things that I think you will see. And when I hear Biden's not doing anything, this is literally the most consequential president since at least LBJ and possibly FDR. And no, he has not made the world 100% better instantly because all those people who had 40 years to make billions of dollars are now doing everything they can to make sure he does not stay in office. And they don't want the taxes that they see coming. They don't want business regulation. They want to continue to be able to run our society. Because as I keep saying to people, there is no more valuable real estate. And I don't mean just the ground and the buildings. I mean the soft power and the military power and the economy and the politics in the world than the United States. And they have had the opportunity to run it for 40 years. They do not want to give it back up to people like you and me. All right, so um, quickly, you asked a couple of questions that feed into this. Um, one of the things that you see going on you right now is an attempt not to win the election. Trump is not trying to win the election. If you notice that, he's not reaching out to Nikki Haley supporters. He's not trying to moderate anything. They're trying to impose the will of the minority on the majority, and they can do so thanks to the Electoral College, for one thing, which is a system that was instituted in the Constitution, I'm pointing to a Constitution on my desk, that says we don't have the popular vote in the United States. And there's a popular vote compact to say that people will, that states will honor the popular vote even if their particular state didn't go for the popular vote. It's a fabulous idea. Personally, I'd like to see us get rid of the Electoral College altogether. The other thing that we could do is to go back to the original point of the um, uh, Electoral College, which is to make the, proportion, the vote in the Electoral College proportional so that that was the way it was originally designed to be. That gets um, thrown out as soon as we get political parties in 1800, and people start to say, well, so long as you know Virginia goes for the Democratic Republicans, we should, by 51%, we should get all those electoral votes. That's a real bastardization of the system, and, and it's a bad thing, I think, but that's what's going on at the Electoral College. You also see around you a desperate attempt Oh, actually, let me throw this one in here. And you see this with the candidacy of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. This is this is quite literally what his aides say that they are doing. I'll be writing about this soon. That their hope is to um, to use the Electoral College to deny Biden the win. That is, I, I think that there's pretty much a sense that Biden is going to win the popular vote. He Trump has never won the popular vote. Remember that. He lost it in 2016. He lost it in 2000. 2020, I mean, he's never actually won the popular vote. But if he can win the swing states, he can win in the Electoral College, which is what the Republicans have done since George H.W. Bush. They have not won in the, in the popular vote, with the exception of the year two, 2004, which was when we were at war, which is a little bit different um, since then. There hasn't been a win like that since then. The Democrats have always won the popular vote, but they lose in the Electoral College. Gore lost in the Electoral College and Hillary Clinton lost in the Electoral College. Um, so, and then of course, sometimes they don't lose in the Electoral College and then we get, um, and then we get uh, people like Barack Obama. So, uh, President Barack Obama. So, um, so what they're hoping to do with the uh, RF Kennedy Jr. Um, is to muddy the waters in swing states enough that the Electoral College is not clear. That is to throw the electoral votes in, um, well, not even an electoral state, someplace like New York to RFK Jr. so that you, they will deprive Biden of 270 votes in the Electoral College, at which point 
the election goes to the House of Representatives where every state gets a single vote. And if there are more Republican dominated states than Democratic dominated states, that would mean that Trump would win under the, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, what that, that means um, is not only reflects not only RFK Jr. It also reflects, I think, what the Trump uh, the Trump campaign is up to, is they want to muddy the vote enough in the swing states that they can do the same thing. Because if they can throw it into the House of Representatives, and crucially, if they can elect enough state delegations that will be Republican state delegations, and that's the, been the, the 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 benefit of the electoral of the uh, the gerrymandering, then they will be able to claim that election, even though. They lose the popular vote by a huge amount. So I think, I honestly think that's what they're up to. All right. So what do you, uh, there's a couple more things here. I'm almost at an hour here. Um, I will say it is significant that, um, ignore the polls. The polls are crap, and I've talked about that before. Um, there's a number of articles about that now. If you're interested in the way polls work, follow Tom Bonnier, B-O-N-I-E-R. He is not a poll. He is a pollster too, but he really analyzes the polls and he's very smart. But um, but uh, the, what you what you want to look for to see how things are going is what are people doing. Republicans are leaving Congress. They're fed up with the MAGA wing of the party. Um, they're increasingly admitting that the, the MAGA wing of the party is controlled by Russian propaganda. Somebody asked why Ron Johnson has been so quiet. I suspect because Lev Parnas, who worked with Rudy Giuliani to smear uh, the Bidens, said that Ron Johnson was the man that they could trust in the Senate to spread Russian propaganda. And that is uh, not a good political look for anybody, right? Um, you asked also about um, principles first. That is a top-down attempt to create a new party. Not yet seeing a groundswell, but that could follow. And is it a problem for the, the Republicans that, in fact, Trump is sucking up all the money out of the RNC? Absolutely, because that means it's going to be much harder in down-ballot races for the Republicans to win. And a down-ballot race not only means a state race it, uh, or a representative or a senator, it also means all the local races. Okay, so what can you do? What can you do, first of all, is to check your registration statuses and uh, status and tell everybody to check, everybody you know to check theirs as well, because we're having, seeing a lot of voter purges. And voter purges come in many different flavors, but what they are is an attempt to argue that because, for example, somebody hasn't voted in two consecutive elections, they've either died or moved, and therefore they need to be knocked off the voter rolls. Um, that's happened to people I know, including people who haven't either died or moved. So make sure you check your registration status. If you are able to do so, you, should, you could also step up and work at the polls. Um, it's a long day. Uh, but it's part of, of the what the Republicans are trying to do is to get rid of election workers so that they we don't know how these elections come out. You could do that. Um, I would also urge you to um, to pay attention to, to all the stuff going around. Obviously, give money or work for candidates if you can. But but here's the larger answer that I always give, and that is that you are seeing the things you are seeing, both the desperation on the part of the anti-abortion people and the, the fury on the part of Trump and the attempt to throw people off the ballots in so many states, the attempt that you're seeing in Mississippi right now to make sure that people can't, um, can't have a voter petition to get things through that they want, the attempt in Ohio to not honor what the voters said they wanted in a petition, and, and in Kansas the same. The reason you are seeing that is because the radicals recognize that they are a small minority. They also believe that they are acting for God, which means that they believe even though they are a minority, that's okay because they're making Christian nationalism become a real thing in the most powerful country in the world. That would be a true victory for their religion. They are. Uh, they recognize, though, that they are a minority and they're doing everything to keep that in place. We are the majority. That doesn't mean you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent. It means you care about democracy and you care about being treated equally before the law and you care about having a say in your government. We are the majority. And the way that we make the majority's voice viable, the way that we change the ship of state is to take up oxygen to say, yes, we care about equality before the law. 
We care about LGBTQ plus rights. We care about abortion rights. We care about all of these things because that is that's what equality before the law means and frankly because that's what the majority of americans want all the positions that people like me are taking right now are not minority positions common sense gun safety legislation polls at almost 80 percent including republicans same with um same as i say with codifying roe versus wade these are popular popular opinions we have to make it clear to elected officials that we will support the people who embrace those positions. And, and we have to challenge those who are not embracing those positions. And, and one of the things I always say, run for something, run for anything, because you may not win in a lot of these places, but you're advertising. You're letting people know that there are people like you out there and people like them out there. So we're kind of here in a full court press now for the rest of the period until and after the election where, you know, people write to me every day. When is the New York Times going to report on this stuff fairly? You know what? Who cares? We can report on this stuff fairly. That does not mean we're going to agree. I suspect listening to me here, a lot of us disagree about a lot of issues. That's fine. We're not going to win all the time on everything. We're not going to lose all the time on everything. Democracy doesn't necessarily mean you win on an issue. It means you get to have a say on an issue. And the MAGA Republicans are trying to take that away from the rest of us, including, by the way, Republicans who are not MAGA Republicans. So even if you are not part of that, it, you know, if you if you sit here and say, well, I've got an R after my name and my mom was a Republican and my grandma was a Republican, that that is a really different kettle of fish than the MAGA Republicans. So our job in the next several months is to make sure that these positions get out in front of people as much as they possibly can. And if you're not comfortable talking to people, we know that talking to your family and friends is the most effective way to get them out and to change their minds. Do remember that, that a friend of mine, and I'm not going to use her name because I don't know if I'm allowed to, and a number of people have put together this cards for uh, Biden for the win cards that, are, that don't say, you know, they're, they're not partisan. They're not like, you know, Biden's great and Trump sucks. They literally just lay out what the different sides want. And, and uh, you know, you've got Biden says, you give me a, a Democratic House and Senate and I will codify Roe, which more than 80 percent of Americans want. The other side of it says, if you elect Trump, you're going to have a national abortion ban that that is national and that probably doesn't have any kind of exceptions for incest or rape. And um, that's that's the facts. That's just what's happening. So those you can print out yourself and you can distribute them quietly um, to wherever you, you feel like they would be most useful. I will say I've been traveling around this country. People who are in red states right now are terrified and they, are, they have reason to be, but for those of us who are not in red states, you know, we can do all we can to help them. We should do all we can do to help them. So my advice to you yet again, take up oxygen, take up oxygen going forward. Anyway, I've gone over now and I'm sorry about that. I will be back, I think, next week. I think I'm in a good stretch here for a while. Thank you for being here and, you know, let's do this. Talk to you later.